to see you all. If you'd like to stand and come into the to the auditorium, we'll start our worship this morning. And good to have you join us on the live as well. Good to see you.
Thank you. Hello, good morning, church. Uh, it's good to see you all. And uh, welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, uh, we would like to, uh, we're glad that you are here. Uh, we, I've seen a couple of visitors this morning. Make sure you welcome them. And uh, it is our prayer that you have a blessed and wonderful time worshiping with us. Church, let's, let's continue to pray for one another. Um, especially for those who are sick, those who are undergoing some difficult times, a lot of things going on in our country, worldwide. So let's continue to pray for one another. I'll be reading from the uh, passages in the scriptures uh, from Psalms 145 from verse uh, 8 to 13 and then I will lead us in a word of prayer. It says here, Lord, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. To make known to the sons of man his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generation. Church, that is the God that we worship. He is full of compassion. He is full of mercy. We might uh, be um, experiencing some difficulties in life, uh, sickness. We might be uh, looking for a job at this time. But it says here, the Lord is good even during difficult times. And we have also a responsibility as God's people. We have to share uh, these truths to the people around us. We have to talk about His great works, about His goodness to all, to everyone. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for this wonderful time that we can come together as your church, O oh Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, thank you for your words that uh, have reminded us of your goodness, of your faithfulness to us. During difficult times, O oh Lord, we might be experiencing some, uh, some with sickness, some might lose their jobs. Lord, a lot of things going on in this world at this present time. But we know that you are in control of everything. You are good to everyone, O oh Lord, as you have promised in your word. Father, we would like to commit to you our worship service this morning. We pray for Pastor Ken as we bring forth your message to us. May this uh, word be a challenge to us. And may each, every one of us, O oh Lord, will be doers of your word and not hearers only. Father, we commit to you everything. May you find our worship pleasing and acceptable to your sight. We want to worship you. We want to praise you. We want, we want to exalt your name. For this is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to stand with us again as we continue this time of worship. And God is good. God is good. And all the time. So let's this morning, church, let's raise a hallelujah. Let's lift up our voices to our King and raise a hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it. Say the word and I will set my feet upon the sea Till I'm dancing in the deep Lord, be be still You are here so it is well Even when my eyes can't see I will trust the God that speaks I'm not gonna be afraid Cause these waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm Just my greater than its war I'm not gonna fear the storm I'm not gonna fear it pray for peace upon your people. I pray that we will be a church that seeks your face, knows that you've calmed the storms in our lives, that you've walked before us, Lord, and you've conquered everything already. And I pray that we will look and seek your face in all that we do. And you are worthy of everything, Lord. And we will crown you with many crowns that we are given and we will praise you for who you are and we'll cry out majesty. You are the Lord of all.
and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Majesty, Lord of all, let every throne before him fall. The King of kings, O oh come adore a God who reigns forevermore. Crown Him the Lord of life, who triumphed for the grave, and rose victorious. This mic on? There we go. Uh, it's that time if our ushers would begin to make their way forward at this time. And I want to encourage us in our giving to give cheerfully to our Lord and to remember all of our missionary projects. It, on Sundays, I'd like to take time to uh, remind us of our missionary family. We currently have 22. Uh, missionaries, and uh, that includes also two 
agencies, that is OMF and GFA, that we support with our missions funds as well. Uh, this week, I want to highlight uh, Cliff and Shannon Wadsworth. Many of you know them. They began a new church plant, Cornerstone Baptist Church in South Auckland, and we've been supporting that work uh, since. And they're doing a fantastic job. They're faithfully preaching the gospel, and yet many are coming to know the Lord, and they're being faithful in discipling. It's, it's a well-worthy a project of our missions fund. So let's continue to uplift them and their family and the church. And uh, just pray for the Wadsworths uh, as they continue on. Pray for all of our missionary family. Uh, the letters are posted on the back wall in our uh, foyer on the missions wall. I believe we have a new letter this week from uh, the Manis in Fiji. And so every time we get new letters, we post them up there, so just uh, check it out regular so that you better know what's happening with them and how you may be able to pray for our missionary family. By way of reporting, uh, last week we praised the Lord for an offering of $7,476, and uh, general was 5733 and missions was 1743 and we just thank the Lord for His faithfulness, the faithfulness of God's people. Um, we do, uh, when we were back in lockdown times uh, in our church, we got, many of us got used to giving online. And we encourage that if, if you would like to continue with that. We also want to make it a time of worship, though. And so we will continue to uh, have an offering time. Even if we give online, that's okay. But this is our act of giving it over to our Lord. So let us go ahead and pray and ask God's blessings upon this week. Lord, thank you for the privilege it is to uh, be in your house this morning to lift up these songs of praise to you. Thank you for the privilege to be called to partner in missions with you, our, our Savior. Lord, I pray for all of our missionary family. And this, this week, this morning, we want to pray for the Wadsworths. Pray for them and their family. Look after them. Keep them strong. Keep them healthy, Lord. Keep their marriage uh, protected and strong. And may they continue to be faithful in the ministry that you've called them to. And may more souls in South Auckland come to know Jesus. May they be built up in their faith. May they be a light and an example of the power of the gospel in their area and with the people that you are bringing to them. Thank you, Lord, for them. Bless this offering. Use it, Lord, for your work, your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. darkness. 
Amen, Kay. Thank you, Kay. What a wonderful song. Our sins are many, but His mercy is more. And that's the message of the gospel of Christ. Today, we're going to continue our look through the first book of the book of First Corinthians. And I'm uh, going to cover from verse number 10 down to verse number 25. It may not be on the overhead, but I'd like to read that before we go into it together. So would you stand with me and let's, I'll read, but you follow along verses 10 through 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Verse 10, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, that those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ would be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the, prudent, uh, the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let us pray. Lord, help us to take these beautiful words of truth and assurance. And Lord, help us to understand them. May your spirit enlighten our thinking, our eyes. Lord, may they penetrate deep into our soul. May we, Lord, better understand the unity of the gospel. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here who is uncertain of their own salvation, if they have a personal relationship with you through Jesus Christ, I pray that you would work in that person's heart and their soul, that they would be drawn to the only one that can save them, Jesus Christ. And Lord, strengthen your people. May we be a bold people. May we be a people that is grounded in the truth that has a foundation of biblical godly truth in our life that we live by each day. Do a work in this place, I pray. In Jesus' name, and your people say, Amen. please take a seat. Please take a seat. The message of the, uh, the title of the message today is called, The Church is to be a Unified Church. A unified church. We're talking about unity. We're talking about divisions within a church. I am thankful 
to have been a part of IBC here since its beginning, 1984. I've been pastoring here since 1993, and I praise the Lord that during this time we have not experienced a church split or major division. Oh, we've had some angry people here and there, where there's people, there's going to be uh, issues, amen? That's just the nature of us. But I praise the Lord that God has kept us in a unified spirit. But we must remember this, that unity is not to be unity at all costs. This is an important distinction. Because many around the world, and even in Christendom, focus on that word unity. But we have to be sure that it is not intended to be unity, whatever the cost. The unity is to be based on one thing, and that is the gospel. The faith one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit that is over all. This is what our unity is to be based on. And if there's anything else, if we have to push these things aside for the sake of unity, then we're trying to build our unity on something that is false, something that is shifting, something that is not the real genuine unity of Scripture, of what Jesus Christ has talked about. I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again. A number of years ago, I received a call from somebody. Uh, he was a leader, the president of some ministerial association in the area. And he asked, Ken, why don't you come to um, our fellowship events? And I tried to explain that, you know, I struggled with having fellowship with some that were to be included in this fellowship that they we're in a part of. But I, I agreed to meet with him for a coffee and, and talk about it. And we did. And, uh, and I tried to explain a little farther. I said, you know, everybody, to have fellowship, that means you have to be in, in agreement. That is fellowship. You have to have a oneness, a foundation of belief and faith and understanding that you're on the same page together. And so to do that, everybody has some lines that they will draw and say, for us to have fellowship, we have to, you know, be in agreement here. You cross over that, and there's not fellowship. We can be friends. I'm not talking about hateful and being enemies. But to have true biblical fellowship, uh, you know, where's the lines? I said, I notice your fellowship. You include many different denominational brands and including Catholics, into your fellowship. And I, I said, I, I know that in Catholic theology, there's some major differences. His response was that, you know, they focus on the 95% of things that they agree on. I said, well, in that 5%, there's some major problems, though, even on important things like salvation itself, the means of salvation. And... He said, well, we just don't go there. We don't talk about those things that we disagree on. We focus on the things that we can agree on. And I went further and said, where is the line then? I says, do you include in your fellowship those that are part of uh, uh, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses? And his only response was, well, no, we don't at this time. I said, well, listen... You know, you go from there and it's only a, a short leap to just including people in your fellowship from all walks, from a Buddhist to a, a, a Muslims, and the list goes on, and let's all just be unified at all costs. And that's what we're talking about. Does, does a standing on the Word of God sometimes bring disunity? And we have to say, yes, it does. Doesn't it? If you stand firmly and squarely on what the Word of God declares, will it sometimes cause disunity with people? Absolutely. Ask Martin Luther. We know the story of Martin Luther. He was the one, he was raised to be a Catholic. He became a priest himself. And he, in his studies of the Word of God, realized that we're saved by grace through faith alone in, the, in Jesus Christ. 
and it started to trouble him because of what he was, how he was taught and what, he, what the church itself was teaching. And so he, you know, he began a campaign to say, let's get back to what the word is teaching us. Did it cause disunity? Absolutely. So much so that, you know, he, he couldn't stay. He couldn't stay in the church. They didn't want him. He was causing trouble. He was a problem. He had to go. So, in this text, last week we saw Paul explaining the importance of being a sanctified, holy people. But now Paul addresses his first issue that he sees and that he's heard of in the church at Corinth. And that is division in the church. He has more to say on this a few chapters later, but he begins it now. It's an important thing. Division has always been an issue among God's people. I've often heard it said, if you put together 10 Baptist pastors in the same room, you're going to have 11 different opinions. That's just the nature of uh, people. Even the 12 apostles didn't always agree. And they had some conflicts. They had some issues. They didn't always get along with each other. Today, we're going to look at closer these three questions that Paul asks in, in verse 13 of chapter 1. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? These are three questions that, that uh, Paul asked them in our text that we read. So we're going to take a look at each one of these a little closer. The first one is, is Christ divided. Again, look at verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are some contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So we see the Corinthians had a four-way division in the church, at least. A four-way division. Some fell behind Paul. Some behind another church leader, Apollos. And some were more in the camp of Cephas. And then others who were trying to appear more spiritual than anybody else said, oh, well, we're really followers of Christ. Now, Apollos is mentioned in Acts 18. The Bible says of Apollos that he was uh, a Jewish believer. The Bible also says he was an eloquent speaker. He was fervent in the spirit, and he even spoke accurately the things of the Lord. So he was a good man of God. At that time, though, as we read in Acts 18, he only knew of John's baptism. He didn't get the full story. He had heard of John. He believed in the Messiah. He put his faith. He was probably baptized in John, by John or by one of his followers in the Jordan. And then in Ephesus, there was a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. And they came and they helped him. They taught him. They discipled him to understand more clearly the teachings of Jesus and his resurrection and the fulfillment of scriptures that Jesus was. And he understood. So this was Apollos. And then later he was a part of the ministry in Corinth. And so the Corinthians had some really good teachers. They had Paul. They had Apollos. Uh, they mentioned Cephas. Now Cephas is another name for uh, the apostle Peter. And so they had, peop they had teachings of Peter, who was also one of the pillars of the church. Why then were they fighting? Why fight about these things? And be like us in our church. I, I, I'm a follower of Pastor Ken. And a group of you said, no, I really think Pastor Mike is the best. And no, I really think Josh has some really good insight and things to say. And then a few of you spiritual ones, well, I follow Jesus. You know, the same kind of thing. Can you imagine? This is what they were facing. 
You see, Corinth was filled with philosophers and teachers, all sharing their wisdom. This was Greece, man. This was the home of, you know, uh, um, uh, Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle. And these were hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene. But these schools of philosophy and, and wisdom were still ongoing. And they prided themselves in, in their higher levels of thought. And so this same understanding of wisdom kind of were, was infused into the church and their thinking in the same way. And so they thought of the gospel with the same kind of philosophical point of view rather than a biblical point of view. But another reason is simple. Human beings, human nature enjoys following human leaders. Uh, they follow a personality. They got their eyes off of the Lord and they put their eyes onto the servants of the Lord instead. And this led to competition. Who's the best servant of the Lord? Who's the most eloquent, the most enlightening one? Now I believe, I believe, I believe God does gift to the church. And I think that's scriptural. Certain giftings. And one of those is being a pastor, being a teacher. And these are gifts that he gives to the church for their edification and for their benefit. And I also believe it's a biblical thing to, for a church to take care of uh, their pastor. It's the responsibility and privilege to love, honor, and care for pastors. These are all biblical things. So what I'm saying here is not, oh, churches don't need a pastor. Uh, no. And we'll get into other Scriptures that teach very much the church's responsibility to those that God has emplaced under their care. But the pastor's role is to constantly be pointing people to Christ, not to themselves. And when you leave this place here, my desire is that you are drawn to the word that you're drawn to the Lord and not to me. That is where we need to be pointing people to. In this church, they were starting to look at the servants of God rather than the Lord himself. The next question that Paul asked, well, we're going to take a look at a little out of order because Paul goes on talking about this. But the question is, are you baptized in the name of Paul? And so verse 13 says, are you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Now keep in mind, baptism was an important part of the New Testament church. And it still is. When a sinner trusts Jesus Christ, and he was baptized. And at this time, though, when they were baptized, it was a serious, important, big thing. Often they would be cut off from their old life and even rejected by family and friends. And most of you here today that have followed the Lord in baptism, it wasn't that way for you. You weren't, probably weren't cut off. I can't say all of you. But it cost them something. And so to say, I'm following Christ, he's my Savior, he's now my Lord, and I'm going to follow him obediently in the waters of baptism, that was a serious thing, and that cost. They were placing, though, a focus on who it was that baptized them. It seems apparent from this uh, paragraph here, it seems apparent that Paul didn't even carry with him a, a record book of the names he baptized. He was trying to remember. He says, I don't think I baptized any of you except these two. 
and said, oh yeah, that, the household, there was a family as well. But apart from that, I don't think there was anybody else. You kind of see his train of thought here. So it wasn't a clear written record that he had. That wasn't the important thing, though. The important thing is that they were written in God's book. That God had their name written down in that book of life. That God knew them. And they were baptized into his name. Is baptism important? Absolutely it is. International what? Okay. So of course it's important. But as a Baptist church, we remember and we teach constantly, baptism does not save us. We don't baptize little babies. Baptism is something that believers do. It is that first step of obedience. We say, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord, and I'm following him now completely. He's the master. I am the servant. And it's like the master. The very first thing the master says to us is, all right, be baptized. And so what's the first response of the servant to the master? Yes, Lord. Right? That is it. And if we have any other response, there's a problem. If our response is, mm, I don't really know if I'm ready for that one, though. Uh, that's asking a bit much for me. Others might see, oh, I might be embarrassed. The uh, water's a bit wet. Pastor Ken might not have put the heaters in. I'm a bit nervous. I don't like to be in front of people. Our response needs to be, yes, Lord. This is what the master has said. Repent and be baptized. In that order. And our response is always yes Lord. And we follow him obediently in the waters of baptism. Not in my name. But in the name of. The Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. That's who we're baptized. In the name of. So it is important. But we have to remember. Um, you're not baptized in my name. Or anybody else's name. And he was reminding the church of this truth as well as they were seeking division and following certain people. He says, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you. So you couldn't say that I, Paul was the one that baptized me. He's like, that's not the important thing here. The third question he talks about is, was Paul crucified for you? This next paragraph this next section of our text emphasizes the power of the gospel versus the weakness of man's wisdom verse 18 for the message of the cross is what it's foolishness to who to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who would believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jew, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Notice the contrast here. The contrast, well, first of all, Paul puts all of the world divided into two. You know, we have a lot of unrest in places these days with racist tensions rising up. We've talked about this many times, many times. What people need is a biblical worldview. Racism would disappear if they had a real biblical worldview. If we see and understand that all mankind came from one man and one woman, 
Adam and Eve. We are all born from Adam and Eve. Therefore, there aren't races. There is a race. We are the human race. And further, all the human race is afflicted with sin. We are all born in sin. This is the human condition. All the human race needs to be saved from that affliction. All the human race needs a savior. We need to be healed from that affliction of sin. If we had that biblical worldview and understanding, where does racism go from there? The world needs Jesus. They need a biblical worldview. But to them it's foolishness. But he places the world into two categories. And this has nothing to do with a race. But he places them into those who are perishing and those who are being saved. That's what the scripture says here. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To the lost, it's foolishness. And Paul reminds us that in the wisdom of the world, the cross is a foolish message. It doesn't make sense. Notice the responses to the gospel seen in the text. There's three main responses. And as we look through these responses, ask yourself, what is your response to the gospel? Which of these three is your response? First of all, we see some stumble at the cross. We see that in verse number 23. Verse 23 reminds us, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block. They stumbled at it. It was a problem. The Jews believed in God. They believed in the uh, creator. They believed there was one God. They believed that in the Messiah. That the Messiah was a promise. But they stumbled at Jesus at the cross. The Jews struggled with the thought of their Messiah hanging on a cross. Because the cross was a sign of, of weakness. It was scorn. It was contempt. It was humiliating. The Jews have an amazing history that was filled with incredible, miraculous things from Jehovah. From the time that Moses led them from the wilderness and the parting of the sea and all the amazing miracles of Elijah and Elisha. And the list goes on of, of all that God had done. And so here they were in, in a Roman culture, Roman-ruled society, and this is supposed to be the Messiah. This is the one. And they were ready uh, to consider it. But if he was the Messiah, then surely it's going to look the way they want it to look. Mighty, powerful. Take over once again. Establish David's throne once again. Rid the country of the Roman rule. And so everywhere Jesus went, we see the, the Jews were requesting a sign. Show us. Show us another sign. And eventually Jesus says, there's going to be no more except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he was referring to his own death. And how he, like Jonah was in the belly of the fish, he would be in the grave for three days, three nights, and would rise again. He says, that's the sign. But for them, it was a stumbling block. The Psalms and the prophet Isaiah often spoke of the suffering of the Messiah and what he was going to endure. But they couldn't see it. The Jews were looking for power and for great glory to be evident. Paul was saying that it pleased God, though, through the foolishness of the cross to save those who would believe. God's ways are always going to be different to the world. God's ways are always going to make the world scratch their head. It's going to confound them. So how about you? Do you stumble at the cross? How could God save me by allowing his son to die on a cross? Yet this is what God has chosen. This was God's plan. And dare I say from the very beginning... 
even before creation, God had this in view. God's plan, not ours. I may have done differently. I may have done my own thing and tried it my own way, but God had His plan that He was to fulfill, and that involved the Messiah, that involved the cross. Some stumble. Next, we see some laugh at the cross. Verse 23, again, to the Greeks, foolishness. It's just foolish. They mocked it. They laughed at it. They scorned the cross. This whole idea. The Greeks prided themselves on wisdom and knowledge. And all the great Greek philosophers of their day and the different schools of philosophy that they had. They were the upper class educated people of the day. And so this Jewish teaching of the Messiah and the humiliation of a cross, like a common criminal, it just was foolish to them. Paul asked the question of them, verse 20, where is the wise, where is the scribe, where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You see, God's wisdom is different than man's. Men, in all of their wisdom and knowledge and understanding and their pride, they puff themselves up, but it is God that will look at them and sees it's nothing. It's nothing. And God makes foolish the wisdom of the world. When thinking of this category of those who mock the cross, who make fun of it, who laugh at the cross, thinking it foolish, no name is more prominent today than that of the scientist, writer, speaker, Richard Dawkins. I know many of you would know the name. He uh, is very well known among uh, the philosophical community, the debaters. and uh, He wrote uh, the book called The God Delusion. On page 285, he writes, they could have devoted, referring to uh, early church writers. He says, they could have devoted their pages and their sermons to extolling the sky splashed with stars or mountains and green forests, seas and dawn choruses. These are occasionally mentioned, but the Christian focus is overwhelmingly on sin, 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 sin. sin. What a nasty little preoccupation to have dominating your life. He goes on, but now the sadomasochism. God incarnated himself as man, Jesus, in order that he should be tortured and executed in atonement for the hereditary sin of Adam. Ever since Paul expounded this repellent doctrine, Jesus has been worshipped as the redeemer of all our sins. And it goes on and on. But this is Dawkins' wisdom. The intellectual wisdom. As he looks at the cross of Christ with scorn. And he looks at it as foolish. As backward. As repellent. Repugnant. He has lots of names that he gives to this doctrine of the cross. And it'd be one thing if this scorn and foolishness only comes from the world, those who are lost. That'd be one thing. But unfortunately, we see a lot of this kind of a talk even among those who are to be Christian writers writing Christian books that are sold in Christian bookstores that Christians are getting and reading and thinking, oh, this is wonderful new stuff. I want to bring your attention for a moment to a man by the name of Brian McLaren. Uh, I, I, I always 
get it mixed up with Bruce McLaren. Bruce McLaren was a great race car driver, Kiwi. Brian McLaren was not. He's American. Raised in a Christian home. And he writes Christian books. And I say that loosely. Because his understanding of the Bible, of doctrine, of salvation is not Christian. He wrote this book uh, called The Generous Orthodoxy. And in it, he talks about this discussion he had with a fictitious character. McLaren describes an encounter with George, a parishioner at his church. George believes in God, but by his own admission, is still no closer to believing in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus doesn't make sense, particularly his death on the cross. George asked Brian McLaren, why did Jesus have to die? Upon hearing the question, McLaren is struck by two thoughts. First, George seemed to be asking the question in a way McLaren had never been asked. Second, McLaren does not think his Christian answers fit the way George is asking the question, whatever that means. McLaren asked George for two weeks to think about an answer. After wrestling with the question but finding no answer, McLaren shares the dilemma with, the, with his brother Peter, saying, a couple of weeks ago, I realized I don't know why Jesus had to die. His brother quickly responded, well, neither did Jesus. After citing the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as evidence, Peter says, it sounds to me like Jesus didn't really understand why he, it had to be that way either. Did Jesus really not know why he was going to the cross? Did it come as a shock and surprise to him? Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And all through Jesus' ministry, he knew why he was here. He knew his role, his mission, his purpose as Messiah. And he kept trying to prepare his disciples for what was to come, what he knew had to happen. Because he was to give his life a ransom for many. Give his life so that others can be forgiven. Yet one more Christian author. William Paul Young, not relation, William Paul Young, I don't know if you recognize the name, he wrote a few years ago, like a number one Christian novel, a book called The Shack, there was a movie made on it, and Christians ate it up, lapped it up, he wrote another book called Lies We Believe About God. In one of the chapters, he says, who originated the cross? If God did, then we worship a cosmic abuser who in divine wisdom created a means to torture human beings in the most painful and abhorrent manner. Frankly, it is often this very cruel and monstrous God that the atheist refuses to acknowledge or grant credibility in any sense. And rightly so. Better no God at all than this one. The alternative is that the cross originated with us human beings. And he goes on to describe that it was us. We came up with it and, and Jesus merely submitted to our way. What we did. And there's so much problems in the theology of what these guys are writing. Why? Listen, when someone who is lost is trying to write theology, there's going to be problems. That's the simple truth. Because the Bible says that natural man does not understand the things of the Lord, of the Spirit, of God. For they are spiritually discerned. And so, when you fall in the category of thinking the cross is foolishness, then of course your theology writing is going to be slightly slanted. And no further in helping the world come to understand and know the beauty of the cross of Christ. 
For some, the cross is a stumbling block. To others, foolishness. And church, I wanted to bring up a couple of examples again of popular, famous Christian works and books, speakers, as a constant reminder that we must be diligent to know the Word of God. We must also be discern, discerning. I fear there's so many that just are not discerning. If they put a label on it, number one Christian book, oh, they, they absorb it. They get it. Now, I'm not saying there aren't some good books, but that's why we must have discernment. And when you pick up some of this stuff, instead of absorbing it and sucking it, say, wait a second, there's a problem here. Why? Because it goes contrary to the Word of God. And so it stands out clear. It shouldn't be a big issue. It shouldn't be such a you know, concern among believers. But unfortunately, it is for some reason. Be discerning. Just be aware. First of all, it helps to be aware to know that not all that is supposed to be Christian is. Be it among uh, you know, writing, theology, speakers, uh, online classes, be it music. There's many categories. And the Christian should be able to have some you know, Christian biblical radar or some biblical glasses by which they look at the world through. And they can see when something's not biblical because they're in the Word. They know the Word. And it runs contrary. To some, it's a stumbling block. To others, foolishness. There's one more category. One more. Some believe and experience the power of the cross. Look at verse 21. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The message, the the foolishness of the message, by the way, doesn't mean the message is foolish. It doesn't mean preaching is foolish. It means that is how it is perceived by those who are lost. It's foolish. But it's perceived something else. It's perceived as something else through the eyes of a believer. Through one who has been born again of the Spirit of God. Through one that God has made anew, made alive. We look at the, the word of God and we look at the cross in a totally different light. Those who are being called by God's grace and responded in faith, they realize this is God's power and God's wisdom. The power of God. Power for what? It's the power to be made spiritually alive. It's the power to be forgiven from all of our sin. Not only forgiven, but to be set free from all of our sin. And we are no longer our victims to sin. We're no longer enslaved to sin. We don't have to live that way anymore. We are set free. We are free to serve God. We are free to live the life that that he intended for us, that he put us here for. We have a purpose and we have a mission. And we're free to live that mission and that purpose now. We are free. We have freedom over death. Where's your victory? Where's your sting? I've been set free from these bondages. And I am free to serve my Lord now. And so to the person who is set free... Uh, who, who is born again, the cross is God's power and God's wisdom. And so I see the wisdom of the world, and then I see God's wisdom. And guess which one really stands out and makes the most sense to me now? The wisdom of God. It's not foolishness. I don't look at the cross and say, well, that, why? That was just silly. I look at it and say, 
what a wonderful, magnificent, brilliant God we have. What a gracious, merciful, selfless, giving God that we have. What a righteous, just, good God that we have. It's the power of God to salvation. Jews, Greeks, doesn't matter. In other words, it doesn't matter your ethnic background. God saves all. Whether Paul was speaking to Jews or Greeks, the message remained the same. Jesus Christ crucified. In church, we're called into fellowship. We mentioned, you know, divisions in the church. That was what Paul was addressing. And he was explaining why, no, 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 we're to be in fellowship. He says, I wasn't crucified for you. You weren't baptized in my name. We're called into fellowship because of our union with Jesus Christ. He died for us. We're baptized into his name. And we are identified now with the foolishness of the cross. This is the basis for spiritual unity. This is, these are the things. This is the message uh, by which we as a church need to say we are one. We are one voice. We are in unity. We are unified. We share this passion for our Lord, for our Savior. Stand with me, would you? With your head bowed for a moment, eyes closed. I mentioned that Paul, you know, sometimes he talks of the Jew and the Greek because these were people he was dealing with. He was writing to the Corinthians. That was in Greece. And there were Jews in Greece. And some of them had lived there a long time. Some were believers be they Jew or Greek, but it didn't matter where they came from. He divided them into two categories, those who were lost and those who were being saved. And that's it. So, which category are you? Are you lost? To be lost is to be without Christ? To be lost is to still be in sin, in the natural man, separated and alienated from God. This is being lost, trying to live life that God gave you in your own power and in your own strength. Trying to find meaning and purpose in your life apart from God. This is lost. And to die in your lostness, to die without God, is to be forever separated from God. Separated from God in a place the Bible says was made for Satan and his angels. But my friends, there's another category, and that is those who are being saved. It words it that interesting, unique way. Sometimes we just refer to those who are saved. And there is a time when we are born again. But the process of our salvation is an ongoing work of God in us. Not completed until we're with Him. We still are in this fallen, sinful world. And he is saving us, his people, you. So which category do you find yourself in? Do you identify with? Do you know that you are saved? Are you being saved today? Or are you lost? If you're lost and you can't say with a confidence, I know Jesus is my Savior. Do not leave this place without coming and talking to me. 
and just say, Pastor Ken, I need to, I need Jesus Christ. I need to trust him today. Would you do that? Would you do that? If you are saved and you know it, praise God. Praise God for that. Remember who you are. And remember the beauty of the cross. It's the world foolishness. But keep your eyes on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for your words to us today from 1 Corinthians. May we take these things home with us and may they be in our heart and mind. I pray for anybody here who perhaps isn't in the faith. If they're still lost, Lord, would you bring them to Christ this morning? Don't let them leave without settling this issue in their hearts. Being confirmed, Lord, and and leaving afresh, clean, new, alive. Thank you for the cross. The beauty of the cross, Lord. Your wisdom. May we live it. May we proclaim it. In Jesus' name. Please take a seat for a couple of moments. Uh, Brother Rene, appreciate you coming and helping with some announcements. Pastor Mike has been asked. He's at a fellowship church down the road. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for the message this morning. And it is our prayer that uh, deep in our hearts that we will be able to respond to the challenge to us. A uh, couple of announcements uh, before we finally dismiss. Uh, youth camp. Uh, well, it's, uh, full payment must be made today. Uh, and I think the, the camp is going to happen next week. So please be reminded uh, to hand in your payments to uh, Josh or Denise. And uh, if you need some more information, just uh, approach them. Uh, prayer meeting. Um, this Wednesday on the 15th of July will be the last uh, prayer meeting for the week, uh, for this term. And from there on, we will have a uh, special uh, meetings uh, to be announced uh, in various times. So please take note uh, of that. Uh, BTCP, uh, Bible Training uh, Center courses. Uh, classes will resume uh, in turn three, uh, that is on the 23rd of July at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be uh, tackling uh, book seven, which is Church Ministry Administration Education. So if you're interested, Please see Pastor Ken or Pastor Mike about this. New members' uh, classes. Uh, this week's uh, six week class will commence on uh, the 26th of July. So this will be a six week uh, class uh, at 9 a.m. So if you're interested or if you want to be a part of uh, IBC and you've been coming to IBC for a uh, couple of times or you want to know more about our church so please uh, uh, come and see Pastor Ken if you want to join this um, missions month uh, the missions month is going to happen next month uh, August will be our missions month and the kick off will be on the uh, 2nd of August Sunday and the theme is uh, this year is let the news of uh, Christ be known, taken from the book of Romans, chapter 10, from verse uh, 14 to 15. So uh, please mark that on your calendar. So that's uh, Sunday, 2nd of August, right or wrong? So we don't have any like what we used to, the uh, kick off uh, dinner. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's come. Oh. Thank you, Brother Rene. As strange times we live in these days, um, with the invention of Facebook, Instagram, and so forth, so on and so forth, every little insignificant little things in our life gets published to the world. Like, oh, we went to a dinner, nice dinner plate. Oh, take a photo, publish, let it be known by everybody. Okay, now this is more important. 
let the news of Christ be known. So kick off what that would be on the 2nd of August. And it will be followed by our taste of missions. We normally have our shared dinner in the past. This time it will be shared lunch. Okay. Uh, so bring a dish to share. And as usual, we will, um, we will have a potluck. Uh, more uh, details will be published uh, as the days go on. For, for now, keep that in mind and please be in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So, for the missions, uh, the, the missionary that we are praying for this week is uh, uh, Cl uh, Pastor Cliff uh, Shannon and Shannon Wadsworth. Uh, we have been uh, supporting them since uh, 2012, uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church. So, also uh, check our uh, missions wall there uh, for some new letters uh, coming from our missionaries. So, yeah, uh, unless, uh, uh, check it out, yeah. And uh, now birthdays. Uh, anybody celebrating birthday this week? Uh, from today up to this coming Saturday. Anybody? Brother Bo? Yeah? No? <laughs> no birthdays? What about anniversaries? Oh, yeah. Brother Jazz are here.